You know, Frankie was saying yesterday that uh, although he was raised in relative poverty, it didn't feel like poverty to him. It just felt like the ordinary life that he was leading. And uh, mine was kind of blessed, and it just felt ordinary to me. Um, when I was uh, uh, in kindergarten, my dad became an elementary school principal, and while he was doing that, he wrote a whole bunch of social studies books. And I really wasn't aware of the fact that he was doing this after school and at night and on weekends. But when I was in middle school, uh, the book started coming out. And this is dad's world history book, or his American history book. And uh, it's Laidlaw's social studies series. He did grades one through 12 for social studies and did three series of that. And then he started doing handwriting books, Palmer Method handwriting books, and renewed that by the kindergarten through eighth grade. All together, counting teachers editions and updates for fresh copyrights, dad wrote 192 school textbooks. When, he, when I was in seventh grade, we moved to Rochester, Minnesota, where he became the curriculum director of the school system and began... Uh, uh, a new adventure in my life. And, you know, it just seemed like ordinary kids. But I remember when I was in when I was in 10th grade, the teacher said, you may want to be you might be interested in how the average John Marshall student did in these Iowa tests. Here's how we did in math and reading and all. But, and I just wrote it all down and made a little line. And later I looked at it uh, years later, the average Iowa test score in our high school was 95 percent. That's what the students were doing, and the the president the the president of our science club invented the spell checker. And you remember how you used to put new programs in computers and have to type type something to get it to start up. Ken was the first one to invent a computer a program where you didn't have to type anything; you just stuck it in the machine. And uh, I don't even know what a local access network is, LAN, but he invented that too. <laughs> And uh, just ordinary kids did things like, you know, be the head of Kodak Color for Southern California and put the color in all the movies and vice president of uh, market sales and marketing for Sealy Mark Sealy Mattress Company. And uh, one of the guys is the chairman emeritus of the psych and psychology department at the Mayo Clinic. You know, guys just did amazing stuff, but they were just, to me, they were just, to us, we were all just kids. Uh, so I came through that and went to McAllister College briefly, and then switched to St. Cloud State College, thinking I'd have a better chance of getting a, a teaching certificate. And at St. Cloud State, it was the first time I had ever been a, a, a student among kids who just weren't very bright. Uh, I used to say anybody with a GED and a pulse was welcome. And uh, I started getting the best grades I'd ever gotten in my life without studying. And so the Vietnam War was starting, so I studied that. And I saw that the Vietnamese had been in conflict with China for generations and that they weren't going to be front men for China if somebody was a front man for China. And then I saw that saying, well, why don't we just block the harbor in, at Haiphong and not let weapon and not let the Russians pour weapons into the country. Uh, why don't we fight in the whole country instead of just half the country? Why do we leave half the country where they can go rest? Uh, it just didn't make any sense. It didn't look like we were really had a strategy to win. And I was the first kid in Minnesota to protest against the war. And then a thing came up where we uh, protested against women's dormitory hours. And we were the first college in the country to abolish women's dormitory hours. And at the time it seemed like an accomplishment, but it really was a t disaster because this little hit college that nobody had ever heard of before suddenly was one of the top 10 playboy party schools in the country. And I'm sure a lot of lives got messed up by what we did. Uh, as I looking back on it, it just it seemed like it was fair, but uh, not having women's dormitory hours exposed a lot of young ladies to pressures that they wouldn't have had if they'd had to say, I have to be back in the dorm at one o'clock or midnight or whenever. Uh, so then uh, 
I taught third grade for a year and went to, and they tried to draft me. I said, no, I'm not going. Uh, thought about going to prison. Uh, my now ex-wife uh, didn't want that. So we went to Canada. And my second day in Canada, I went to hear Pierre Trudeau speak. And he said that his time as prime minister of Canada would turn the world irrevocably in the direction of a cashless economy. I had no idea what a cashless economy was. I thought, is everything going to be free? Is it some kind of socialism? What the heck is a cashless economy? Uh, but that phrase stayed in my mind. And uh, seven years later, after the whole Rochdale adventure was over, uh, I walked into a bank and saw my first ATM machine. And I realized what it was going to be. And that night I had a dream that I was talking on a payphone, and suddenly I was surrounded, the phone booth was surrounded by guys in uniform who tracked me down because the world computer system had told them that the guy they were looking for was in that phone booth. He just paid for a call. And so the next morning I got up and began advising hippies to go back to the land and get their own, grow their own food, get their energy from the wind and the sun and the running water and get in a position where they could live without whatever the world was going to be calling money on down the line when it all became cashless. And uh, as I was doing that, I met an old German guy named Paul who uh, had similar ideas. And we began, every night we'd look through the newspaper looking for little incremental moves forward towards the new world order and the cashless economy. And one, oh, <laughs> by the way, at the, at this point in my life, I'm looking like this. And this is, a, this is a picture of me addressing a general meeting of Rochdale College. And uh, this is what we can see it here. This is what a general meeting of Rochdale College would have looked like. So the, the crowd that I'm addressing in the, from the microphone here looks kind of like that. And uh, then, uh, but my friend said, look, uh, oh, the new Toronto phone books came out. And on the cover of the new Toronto phone book was the logo of the Montreal Olympics. And he said, look, they put the number 666 in the logo of the Montreal Olympics. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, the Bible says that number will be associated with this cashless economy and new world order that we've been studying all the time. I said, you're kidding. There's something about this in the Bible. And by then we'd all been thrown out of Rochdale and I was sleeping on the couch of somebody who had a Bible. So I went and got the Bible off the shelf and flipped towards the back and thinking this is like a needle in a haystack. How am I ever going to find this in this big book? I don't know anything about. And I looked up and saw the word revelation as I scanned down about two thirds of the way down the first column. I looked at it said 603 score and six. I had turned right to the page. I read the paragraph there about the mark. And then the whole chapter 13 about the new world order, like I said, that Satan or the dragon, which I assume to be Satan and is, uh, gave all of his power over to someone who had power over all nations, tribes, and tongues. And I figured if Jesus knew that 2,000 years ago, he must be the son of God. And then I looked at the beginning of the, pro of the revelation and it said that John wrote it on the Isle of Patmos in 96 AD. I remembered from Sunday school that Jesus lived to be 33 years old. So I figured, well, if Jesus can tell John that 63 years after they murdered him, he must be raised from the dead. And that means in all of world history, he's the leader of the good guys in every generation. And I had to try to find out what the good guys were, who he, who he was, first of all, more about who he was. And then over the years, um, there's a, a I ran into a book, some books by a lady named Mary Stuart Ralph. One of them was called The New Money System, and another one was called uh, When Your Money Fails. Let me just show you the covers of those. This is When Your Money Fails. You can see it's got all these examples of 666. And this is The New Money System, which is mostly about barcodes and stuff like that. And one of the illustrations she had in there was when the Yom Kippur War got over and Anwar Sadat reopened the Suez Canal under Egyptian control, 
he had his largest warship with the number 666 in big letters on the side of it. And that reopened the Suez Canal. And then not long after that, uh, the Trilateral Commission came along. And here you see the three sixes in the logo of the Trilateral Commission. And they introduced Jimmy Carter as the next president of the United States. And his whole cabinet was part of the original Trilateral Commission. Also what we call the, the mainstream media, New York Times, Washington Post, Associated Press, all three networks, Time, Newsweek, all those groups were represented in the origin of the Trilateral Commission. And at their 40th anniversary, David Rockefeller thanked the media for not telling the public that they existed. <laughs> so if they wanted you to know, you would have, because they control all of the media. Uh, another thing that I found in my research, I believe it was uh, March of, uh, well, it was in uh, 1915 that J.P. Morgan got together a bunch of uh, media guys, newspaper guys, and had them study the American media to figure out which newspapers he would have to control to control all the information coming out about preparedness for World War I, military, finance, international issues, all of that. They identified 25 newspapers that he'd have to control. So he sent guys out to each of those newspapers making contracts that they would replace their chief editor with an editor appointed by J.P. Morgan and that he would have control over all of the things that mattered to Morgan and that he would not let other ideas come into it. And we've got that now that they're holding out other, we've all, they've, all, they've been doing it a long time, but it's becoming more obvious now uh, when you get a president that they won't let speak. <laughs> and then uh, get into the Carter administration. Carter set up this thing called individual, re individual retirement accounts, IRA, and said, if box nine is an IRA payment, enter 666. Identify the kind of payment by showing one of the following code numbers after 666. One for premature dispersal, two for rollover, three for disability, etc. So that was built into the individual retirement account so that people would have all that invested and they would say, well, we can't back out of this now. Now, Christians complained about this, and Carter took it out after a while, but it was in the original IRA forms. There was a Social Security application, had this 66 printed on it, uh, brief, uh, again, briefly. But the highlight of the Carter administration was jump-starting world terrorism. And right after world terrorism was jump-started, the Pentagon's Defense Management Journal in the first quarter of 1980 had this cute little cartoon of the torch being passed from 451, like 451 Fahrenheit, to 666. 666 is receiving the baton. Uh, I first saw this in Mary Stuart Ralph's book, but I've looked it up in the Defense Management Journal and it's there. Actually, it's on two, it's on two pages. It doesn't take off all of both pages, but it's, it goes from one page to another. It's probably why she's got that line there. And then we began getting imports from China. And this was one of the first shirts that came in from China. I had a picture here. I didn't think it was going to show very well. And I, I put it away of the actual shirt that this came off of. But what, and if you're, this was this was in a book published in 1980, so it had to be one of the first things coming in from China. And except for the guy that Carter had, every American ambassador, at least up to the time I was reading about it, for to to China, starting with uh, George Bush being the original envoy, everyone except the one under Carter was a skull and bones guy. The Skull and Bones was doing the opium trade with China back in the 1800s. And uh, I was wondering about, you know, the, there's this uh, Dick Cheney's daughter is leading all this anti-Trump campaign. And I began when I got, and also Dick Cheney was kind of the father over the, as vice president, sort of guiding George Jr. and how how to run it. I was wondering if Dick Cheney was a member of Skull and Bones. You know, Skull and Bones 
Uh, I saw Dick Cheney was not a member of Skull and Bones, but 10 people named Cheney were Skull and Bones, mostly back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, the, the Russell Company, the founders of uh, Skull and Bones, were doing all this trade in China with opium. And what they would get in exchange for the opium was silk and tea. And the Cheneys were the silk manufacturers. So the, the Cheneys have, have been part of this for years. And then here I just drop some stuff. <laughs> but you see the sixes in uh, bank cards. If you don't, if you don't look for it, you don't see it. But there's, you've got the the sixes and the bank cards. And one day I, I was in back in my hometown of Peoria, and I ran into two little things. They looked like little convenience stores, but they were banks. And one of them was United Federal. And there they've got the three sixes in United Federal. And the other one was uh, Peoria Savings. You got the sixes there. They're stylized sixes. There's different ways of doing it. And then the, the barcode, oh, here, uh, Champion International. And you could make a case for Planned Parenthood. I mean, that's not as uh, clear as the rest, but Planned Parenthood's got something going on there. And then here you see the World Future Society. This is Alvin Toffler and all those guys that are telling everybody how wonderful it is when everybody gets all connected with their artificial intelligence and their there and the 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 uh, this, the granddaddy of all of it google the lines between the colors going around the center circle you've got three sixes right in the middle of the google logo and that's that's where a lot of the real control is now. That's what's controlling. Where, in fact, that's where we're sending this program right <laughs> up into the cloud. The prince of the power of the air. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see this from here, but Pierre Trudeau's license plate was 666 on his Mercedes. It's, it's not very clear down there, but you can tell it. And you got them here. That's about enough. There's the old American Eagle postal symbol. And sometimes that's put into banks. Hollywood Federal, Hollywood Federal down in, in near Miami. So then uh, life goes on. Uh, I'm studying all this stuff seeing what's going on. And uh, this is a, the, the, you're asking about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is the oldest black neighborhood in Atlanta. It's where Friedman, when Friedman came uh, to the city after the Civil War, uh, they were told to stay south of those railroad tracks. And the railroad tracks are the north, are the, the boundary between us and downtown. And when the kids started getting missing and murdered, the Atlanta missing and murdered kids thing, uh, I ran into a, a prophet at a, a McDonald's restaurant in downtown Atlanta, and his name was Mike McDonald. And he said that uh, the Lord had told him that he was to come to Atlanta, and he hitchhiked to Atlanta from California to tell the task force investigating the missing and murdered kids that he... Uh, the kids were being killed by a uniform veteran white policeman whose last name was Williams. He said he'd been in town for about three days, but the Lord had just told him that the timing, there was a timing. He was supposed to go over there right then and tell the task force. He asked me if I wanted to come with him. I said, okay. So we went on over there and the Lord knew that when we got there, George Bush was standing on the sidewalk in front of the task force office talking about the computer that the federal government was giving them to keep track of all the leads and all the evidence. And uh, so we walked together behind Bush. And then he said, this is going to take about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, do you want to come in with or wait outside? And I said, I'll wait outside. 
he went in for about 15 minutes and came on and then came back and lived in the hood right in the middle of Pittsburgh with me for about a month or so. And then he said, Bill, it's going to be a long time before people are going to find out, before we're going to find out how this works out. I'm supposed to go back to California. And he went down to I-20 and stuck out his thumb and left. And so there, here I am with the only, the only one in town who knows about this. And so I went to Hosea Williams. And I, I, Hosea was a friend of mine. And I told him the story. And he reached over and picked up the phone and called Lee Brown and Brown's office and said he wanted to talk to Brown about this. And they said that he was in a meeting, but he'd get back to him. Hosea called and called and called for at least two weeks, maybe three. Couldn't get them to talk to him. And he was just, he's, he's, you know, Hosea Williams was Hosea Williams and Lee Brown was new in town. Uh, he was in the state legislature at the time. I mean, he was an icon. People return his calls. And uh, he said he couldn't understand it. So I went to Arthur Langford because by then Arthur Langford was, had, was doing organizing people to look for clues on Saturday morning. A white cop named Williams was still a good lead. He was, they had by no means uh, cleared him, but they, they didn't have enough evidence to charge him. And uh, about four days later, Wayne Williams was picked up on the streets, uh, on the bridge out there at the Chattahoochee River, and all the attention focused on him. Uh, years later, I was talking to the uh, guy who had been the, he'd been the sheriff, he'd been on the task force, he'd been a policeman. He'd, at, that time, at the time I was talking to him, he was in charge of all adult probation in Atlanta. And uh, he said, people often ask about that. And he reached over and he pulled out a yearbook, a police yearbook. And it's just like a high school yearbook. It's got everybody's picture in it. And right there in the middle of the picture was the uniformed veteran white cop named Williams. When I went back to get it from him later, he gave me the 1985 book instead of the 81 book. So he was no longer in uniform. He had become a detective. But this, what's this? Uh, C.W. Williams, something like that. He, this is this is the guy that was described by the prophet. There's no one but this guy who meets the description that the prophet gave, and so I go to Mary Welcome and I go to the Al Binder, to Wayne's lawyers and talk about this. And when I get, when I talk to Al Binder, uh, the when I got home from talking to Al Binder. There was a police car in front of my va the vacant house I was staying in, and uh, from then on, I was followed 24 hours a day for about two months, maybe, uh, by a combination of uniform cops in cars, unmarked cars with white guys in them that either some were cops, but some were not. Some were probably Klansmen. Uh, when, and... Uh, there was this guy that I, I met later that I was, I was helping. He, he had become homeless, but he had been a policeman at that time. And uh, he said, those guys wanted to kill you so bad they could taste it. He said, they, all they talked about was how badly they wanted to kill you, but they felt like they couldn't. And I said, well, I know the reason they couldn't is because God was protecting me. But I bet the reason that they gave to each other of why they couldn't kill me was because they didn't know who I was and they didn't know where I came from and they didn't know who'd come looking for me if I died. He said, that's exactly right. They were afraid that if the, the you know, you obviously had a Northern accent, the, you know, your dad might send private investigators down here to find out what happened to his son and the whole thing would blow up and they wouldn't have any control of that. And they were just afraid of who might come looking for you if they killed you. And that's the only reason they didn't. And uh, so that's uh, that part of the story. Uh, another part of the story, uh, is Jerry Lucas and Theo Maddox. Uh, if you're following anything on Trinity Broadcasting, they got this rabbi now who's talking a lot about the numerical values of various words in the Old Testament. And uh, remember Jerry Lucas, the basketball player? All-American at Ohio State and led the New York Knicks to the NBA championship. And he's an incredible memory guy. Uh, he would do, th 
he creates pictures that he uses to memorize stuff. Like when he was a kid, he had to memorize the capital of Minnesota. So he had a flagpole and at the top there was a little circle with a, with a mouth and eyes and face in it. And he would, uh, and a halo up above it and straws coming out of his mouth going into ice cream sodas. Well, that's St. Paul many sodas. <laughs> and he would use that picture to remember that capital. And then he had another one where he had like a, a tin can and the tin can had a couple of arms and the arms were sewing something and coming around the side of the tin can was like a big toe and that was Topeka can sauce. And that's how he remembered the state capitals. And he did that with everything from childhood on up. He started doing it in early elementary school and uh, it, he was a straight A student at Ohio State, was a Rhodes Scholar, and uh, still had time to play basketball all day because he memorized all he needed to know very quickly. Well, he was doing a study, uh, a thing on how to memorize the Bible, a workshop on how to memorize the Bible. And this kid named Del Washburn came up to him and said that he had been going, he, one day he was going through the, the dictionary and he happened to see under Greek, he saw where the Greek alphabet, all the letters had numerical values. So he thought he would go through the New Testament and write the numerical value over every word and see if he saw any patterns. And he saw that when they drew the net to land full of great fishes, 153, that that verse was evenly divisible by 153. And so were words like net and fishes were also divisible by 153. And then he saw that the word Jesus was 888. And phrases about Jesus, like, behold, a virgin shall conceive a son and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, were also evenly divisible by 111. And this child was evenly divisible by 111. And so he and uh, 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 Lucas got to get, you figure with Lucas memory, having memorized the Bible. And then here you see over here, you see the same thing for Hebrew. Hebrew only goes up to 400 because it's got four less letters. The Greek goes up to 800. Omega is 800. And uh, so after they did the first, uh, oh, 30 some, things with Jesus, they took it to a statistics professor and asked him, what were the odds of that? And he said, if you put dots this far apart and cover 200,000 Earth's surfaces with them, <laughs> one dot would be the chance <laughs> that all of those, that, that those 32 things would turn out to all be evenly divisible by 111. And of course, he's got a whole book full of those things. Uh, I had his book right here. Yeah. This is the Theomatics book, and it's still available. It's got chapters on, and the chapter on the church is 144. And there's a word, there's a number that's like for liar and deceiver and fire and hell and all that. And it's 276, the number of people that were on the ship that sank with Paul on it on the way to Rome. Uh, here's just one, one, of, one of his memory things. Here you see it's Christmas time and the spirit is getting gifts. These are the gifts of the spirit. The wisdom tooth, knowledge, where someone took a bite out of the, the ledge there, face for faith, healing, miracles, prophecy. This is a, a little ocean propped up. And then a little hose coming out of that distinguishing of spirits. The dish is extinguishing the distinguishing the spirits. And here you have tongues and entire prostation of tongues. And that's the way he fits some of these things together. Um, I guess the next step, I'm not sure what time it is, but I guess the next step was I was down in Florida after the whole adventure with the, the, the um, 
uh, oh, the guy's following me around all the time after all that was done. At the end of that, uh, after Wayne's trial was over, uh, I went and met his new lawyer, uh, Al Binder, told him the soul, whole story, and then I felt a release to be able to leave. And I went, went down to Naples, Florida and began teaching school and a little Christian school. During that time, I had a dream that I, in, in this dream, I was uh, speaking to the founding convention of a Canadian Christian political party. And in Canada, social security number, oh, and I was presenting the platform, but I wasn't a candidate. I think I might have been like the chairman of the platform committee or something like that. And uh, in Canada, social security numbers are called social insurance numbers. So the initials are S-I-N. And just like we see S-S-N, social security number all the time, what they see is S-I-N, social insurance number. It's a SIN number. And instead of saying it is Corban or instead of obeying the fifth commandment, they say it is government. The taking care of our parents is not our responsibility. That's the government's responsibility. And all these things are the government taking responsibility for caring for the poor. All of these things that the church is supposed to be doing. And it was easier for the government to get control of these things because we're not doing it. Uh, if, if every Christian was laying hands on people and healing them and emptying out hospitals and stuff. The, uh, the health care would not be a government issue. If, we, if everybody worked, ate their own bread, had, uh, you know, work with willing hands so that you do not steal instead of stealing, work with your hands so that you can have, be able to help others. The church took care of widows and orphans and families worked together so that everybody had what they needed. All this, you know, food stamps, welfare, all of that wouldn't happen. If people only slept with the person they married and that, you know, people, first of all, got married before they started their sex life and then had faith that God would provide for whatever children he gave them, that the children would be a blessing. Uh, nobody would even think about abortions. I didn't even know that you could kill a baby in the womb until they legalized it and started talking about it. It wasn't, you know, I'm sure that there were some happening back then, but not very many and not for monogamous merit, not being done by monogamous married Christian couples. So when I was giving this speech at the platform, I was showing that if people would live the gospel, it would solve the government's problems. Like let's say a young couple falls in lust and they have a couple of kids and then they keep sinning and he goes to prison and she goes on welfare. Let's say they both get saved. He comes out of prison, marries the baby mama, they get jobs and raise the kids. And every time they do that, that saves $100,000 a year for some level of government. They don't have to house him in the prison. They don't have, and they pay taxes. Uh, and so just going through showing how if, and, and the way you campaign is you lead your neighbors to the Lord and disciple them. And so then uh, in uh, December of 1983, um, Trudeau was going around the world promoting his world peace plan. And the world peace plan was basically world government. And uh, he had three countries left to talk to, Russia, Israel, and the United States. And shortly, uh, I think it was about the middle of December uh, in 83, he showed up at the White House and was in, in the White House, came out and had a press conference outside the White House on the lawn. And Reagan was talking and uh, Reagan wished him Godspeed in his efforts to create world peace. I said, well, whatever else Reagan has going for him, if he doesn't know better than to say Godspeed to a guy who's got 666 on the license plate of his car, there's something missing here. Because the only place that the word Godspeed occurs in the Bible, it says if anybody comes to you not preaching this doctrine that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, 
do not invite them into your house, neither bid them Godspeed, or you will be a partaker of their evil deeds. And so when, when that happened, uh, I decided to take the platform from the dream and go to New Hampshire and run in the, run in the New Hampshire primary. Uh, at that time, I was, I was dead broke. Uh, I was supposed, the, the entry fee to the New Hampshire primary was $1,000. And uh, I had drawn my sister's name for Christmas presents and was supposed to give her Christmas presents and I didn't have a dime. And uh, so I, my mom gave me three books of food, three books of green stamps. <laughs> and I took these three books of green stamps and got Carol Joe 10 presents. And she says the best collection of presents she ever got. And I went up to dad's bedroom as he was getting ready to go to bed and told him what I felt the Lord wanted me to do. And he listened and then he looked up at me and he said, said, Bill, says, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I love you. Tell God, tell mom to write you a check. <laughs> and when I got up the next morning, mom had written a check for $1,500 and I sent a thousand of it to the secretary of state in New Hampshire. And the guy who had told me about what Trudeau had said on TV, uh, um, loaned me his taxi cab because he, he'd been driving a taxi cab. He didn't, he had a big sign on the back of it that said, Jesus, you know, uh, and uh, so I headed off to New Hampshire. And when I got to New Hampshire, the only name I had in New Hampshire was the state director of the Full Gospel Businessmen. Now, he had no interest in politics, but he went to the largest charismatic church in, in New Hampshire. So I went there and they were all enthusiastically getting ready to support Reagan for renomination. And I didn't feel like I ought to say anything to any of them about my running because it no need for strife. I mean, they were going to do what they were going to do and I wasn't going to win anyhow. And so I made a bunch of leaflets like this one. And on the front, I had a bit of the platform up here on top and then uh, a picture someone took of me. And this thing says, if we meet and you forget me, you've lost nothing. But if you meet Jesus Christ and forget him, you've lost everything. Uh, down here, uh, picture of Jesus in the clouds from a, from a, a was it an Osborne book. Uh, the answer is Jesus. So this, and then on the back, I had a collage of places where the sixes have occurred all over the, the place. Uh, and I got about 37 votes <laughs> and came on back to, to Florida. And uh, basically all I did, I put these on uh, windshields in shopping centers and they had a thing on, uh, everybody could talk five minutes on public television. And I talked only about the positive part of the platform. I didn't talk about the sixes in that video. And uh, then I hitchhiked on up to, New ha to Idaho because they were the last state to choose delegates by caucus. And I thought maybe I could connect to some people, but I didn't. And the last thing uh, of the campaign, I decided that I'd go down to hitchhike down to uh, Dallas and just watch the people who were coming into the Republican convention, just kind of get a feel for who they were. Uh, I had run as a Democrat, partly because I thought it was easier for the Democrats to tell the difference between me and them. And uh, when I say it doesn't matter what the abortion laws are. If nobody wants one, nobody gets one. The Republicans wouldn't necessarily see the difference between that and their position of trying to outlaw it. Uh, and as I came through the, uh, got down to Dallas, uh, I was at what turned out to be the media entrance. And uh, there was Roland Stewart. <laughs> with this on, looking for the part. <laughs> with this wig on <laughs> and a shirt that said John 316. So I went over and talked to him. This guy looks like a, a witness. I see what he's doing. I had actually seen him at a distance at the Democratic Convention in New York three years earlier, four years earlier. And uh, 
So he was just standing there, and it, it turned out that we were at the media entrance. And, of course, he knew that. Uh, he's very media savvy. And so as people were coming in, every maybe every 20th reporter, 15th reporter would stop and say, are you that guy we see on TV all the time at the golf tournaments? And Roland would nod his wig. And he'd say, well, uh, how do you get your tea? You'd just ask him a few questions and then go on. And Roland said he was creating all those little side stories that all the guys who were there to cover the convention would have a little extra story about the Lord. And his, his answers were all very like rehearse, like, how do you get the tickets? The Lord provides the tickets. He put the Lord in everything. How do you get from you? He put God and Jesus in the answer to virtually every question. But at the end of it, he insisted that they include something that said that the rapture was going to be the following fall and uh, Yom Kippur. And uh, later we found all these news stories that he had generated and they all had the same false prophecy <laughs> that, that we're all going to get raptured on some day that was long gone, you know, but every year he believed that the rapture was going to be that year. Uh, the way he got saved was that he had uh, been doing the rainbow wig thing, but not saved. He was going around to all these sporting events and working with the cameramen and he'd do a little rehearsal and they would show uh uh, he, they'd show it to the director, and then when the halftime came or a timeout, they'd say, okay, cue Roland or cue Rainbow Man, and where he'd do his thing, you know, and, and he knew all of them. Uh, but when he got saved, it was the night after the 1980 Super Bowl, and he went back to his hotel room, and he was tired, and he was kind of burnt out. It was like the whole thing had been kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and he worn just a little thong the last time he did it and uh he was laying there and he turned on the television set and whoever was the last person there had been watching trinity broadcasting and uh charles taylor came on with today in bible prophecy talking about how all these prophecies are being fulfilled by today's news and roland accepted that and at the end of the show uh, he got down on his knees on the side of the bed and recited the prayer that Charles Taylor was saying. And then Taylor says, you know, we're going to Israel and you can come to Israel with us. And Roland had been make, had made some money doing a Budweiser commercial as the Rainbow Man and he had other money. So he went on to Israel with Charles Taylor and got baptized in the Jordan River. But while he was praying to accept Christ, he saw that if he wrote believe in Christ Jesus on his t-shirt, that he could keep getting in front of television and he could evangelize through that message. And so the first time he did it was uh, the miracle on ice. When the Americans won the gold cup in, in hockey in 1980 in the Winter Olympics, he, he went on and uh, in the back and forth, it's hard to get on in hockey because they move so fast. But they had a fight and the fight caused the cameras to stay in one spot long enough for Roland to run around and come running down the aisle. And he's coming down the aisle. You can see him taking off this cover shirt and it got, he's got believe in Christ Jesus on his shirt. And Jim McKay is screaming, there's that guy. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. <laughs> and it's Roland only he's got believe in Christ Jesus on his shirt. They didn't quite realize what he had done at that time. But then the next thing, thing was he went to the Moscow Olympics and Jimmy Carter had boycotted the Moscow Olympics. And uh, just a, a thing that uh, a, a side thing maybe comes in here is that they put the three sixes in the Korean, in the Montreal Olympic logo. And then they had Carter boycott the Moscow Olympics. And then they had the Russians boycott the Los Angeles Olympics. And then they put the sixes back in it at the Korean Olympics. And I, I had this sign in one hand behind the boxing at the Korean Olympics. And in the other hand, I had a sign that said Revelation 13, 18. <laughs> and my good friend, uh, who's the chaplain of the Brazilian soccer team, the next time he saw me, he said, it's a little too early for that. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I don't think it's too early anymore. I think people need to see that this is what's going on. And when they talk about the new world order and the cash and uh, you know the the deep state or all of that, the you know agenda twenty one whatever that they're talking about Satan. And when they're talking about the Chinese Communist Party, they're talking about Satan. And when it says that Satan, the, the dragon, is going to give all of his power to this guy who becomes the world dictator, that that's it. Satan's got this power going on. Sometimes people are motivated by greed. Sometimes they're motivated by desire for fame and attention. They, he knows what can motivate each one of them, and they don't all need to know what each other is doing. But there are some guys up at the top who have a, you know, like, these guys, uh, the Tragedy and Hope guys. This is Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley, and 1,300 pages <laughs> detail of how these guys run the world. And like he's a Harvard train, Harvard historian, whose job was to be the historian of the. Well, here it's called the, the Council on Foreign Relations in England. It's the Inst Royal Institute of International Affairs. It's the round table group. Uh, and, you, you know, the Club of Rome and the Bilderbergers and all of these things, the Trilateral Commission, that he's been the, recording all this. And one of the things that, the thing that surprised him, uh, sometimes every once in a while he's surprised at what they did. He can't figure out. Why did they start building up Germany as a as a as a power as soon as the American Senate turned down the League of Nations? Well, World War One didn't get us a world government because the Americans wouldn't join, so we're going to have to have another one. So they began building up Germany, and you can see how they got all these forces involved in in building up the war material, the war machine of Germany, so that they could run another war. And they got the United Nations out of it. And after the United Nations, then they said, well, and after they managed to get the, the, the uh, atomic bomb to the Russians, then they said, well, both sides have got the atomic bomb. You can't fight a war to win anymore. You're going to have to just uh, have limited wars. The idea of limited wars came up. And uh, I guess the first limited war was Korea. And John Foster Dulles said that the 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 primary reason that he told Eisenhower to fight in Korea was to establish the precedent that the United Nations could declare war on somebody and fight a war. Uh, I forgot where I was just about to go before I got sidetracked to that. Uh, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And now I think the idea is if this is all coming down, whether we're going to get raptured or not, somebody's going to have to live without the mark of the beast. And if the church is going to disappear, they should at least leave a framework for the people who are going to be persecuted. Now, people are being persecuted in Iran. They're being persecuted in China. You look at things like uh, Watchman Nee uh, deciding to die in prison instead of establishing the precedent that we could pay ransom to get Christians out of prison in, in China. And then uh, the heavenly man talking about how he was, he was in prison in China and he, he'd broken his legs and uh, was all crippled up. And he said, every, every day or two, they'd take come to his cell and carry him out of his cell and take him down to the room where they beat him. And he said, it worked out pretty good. I enjoyed telling them about Jesus and they seemed to enjoy beating on me. <laughs> And he just would live in that way. And there was another leader from the underground church in the next cell. And the, the guy in the next cell said, the Lord says, you're supposed to escape. And at that point, he was lying on his back with his legs up against the wall to try to reduce the pain. And he would spend most of his day just laying on his back on this, his cell floor with his legs up against the wall. And he said, well, why don't, why don't you escape? You can, you can run. <laughs> and he said, no, the Lord says you're supposed to escape. So when he got up to escape, his legs were healed. And he began walking out. And as he came to the first gate, these two guards were talking to each other, and they were in an animated conversation. And the gate was open just a few inches. 
And he just slid right on through and went up and he went through three different gates where the, the, the guards were distracted and the gate was ajar and he went right on through. He walked right out the front door of the prison and there was a taxi cab waiting for him with his wife and kids in it. <laughs> and the guy who told him to escape watched him to get in the taxi cab and leave. And was at, he was leaving and then he got some fake ID he was using to try to fly out of the country. And before he flew out of the country, the, the Lord said, when you get to the airport, don't say a word, no matter what, the, just, just let them just talk about your, and so they spent about 15 minutes, the different officials talking about his identification. But finally they let him go through and he got out. And later he was in Scandinavia, Switzerland, Sweden, somewhere there. And uh, that's, I know Switzerland's not Scandinavia, but he was, he was in Europe. And after he got done speaking, this man came up to him and said, I know, you know, the reason that they didn't, uh, that the Lord told you not to speak was that I was over there last year installing voice recognition technology at all the airports. And they've got tape recordings of your sermons. And if you had said anything, they would have known it was you and they would have arrested you again. And so, you know, we've got, and now they got these social credit scores in China, where if you, they, they, they've got this technology and Bill Gates and apparently invented it for keeping track of students when they're, so that if your student was doing online learning, you could tell whether he was really learning and you could tell whether he was a paying an attention. You could also tell whether he was believing what he was told. And they've got all this now watching, uh, monitoring everybody in China so that even if they say, yeah, we agree with the government, if the technology knows that you don't really agree with the government, that marks down your score. And if you've got a low social credit score, you can't fly in an airplane or you can't do this. And the worse your social credit score is, the more restrictions there are on you. And that's what you can see is like the mark of the beast. You know, right now, I know a lot of people have had the vaccine, but they've been trying to get people to get the vaccine. And I just heard something, some city, I think it was Philadelphia, but some big city, when the uh, uh, smallpox hit, 70% of some city was killed by the smallpox. Millions of people were killed by the plague and the smallpox. You hear about these diseases that killed like half the people in Europe and stuff like that. Well, the population in the United States is 350,000, 350 million maybe. So 1% of that would be three and a half million. So 1 million people would be one third of 1%. Half a million people is one sixth of 1%. We've just had a disease kill one sixth of 1% of the people in the country. And we shut it all down and changed presidents and did all this stuff. And then we say, oh, Trump murdered half a million people. <laughs> Most of whom were senior citizens who were already ill. But anyhow, uh, anybody got any questions? <laughs> I don't have a gallery view. Let me get my gallery view. Yeah. Bill, just a, a short time ago, uh, I don't know I'm getting echo. I'm going to close this down. Uh, sorry. Um, Am I pausing an echo? I guess you can hear me now. Um, just a short time ago, I talked about, or is it still echoing? There's so much noise in the background. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know how to do the two. We uh... my machine. Well, Joel, you got a question? Anyone? Yeah. Hey, Joel, this is Randy Hall. When you mentioned Jerry Lucas, uh, he, uh -huh. did he did memorize the New Testament. Right. And he also yeah. memorized the entire 
tuyau s'étend de l'ouest. <laughs> yeah, he he had a thing where he was on uh, one of those late night talk shows, and whenever anybody was, as the people came in, there were 300 people in the audience. He introduced himself to each one as they came in and asked them their name, and of course they sat wherever they wanted to. And then they had the whole show, and he came out at the end of the show, went out to the edge of the stage, and named everybody in the audience. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. He's a, well, I, I found it difficult to, to, to really appropriate these techniques myself. I mean, there's a few things that I've, I've learned with it, but I, I don't know. And I've tried to teach it to a couple people. It's, it's, it's not. Yeah, we lost Bill's audio for a second there again. <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill, we lost your we lost your audio for a second there. Okay. Well, there you go. You're you're back. Hey, Bill. Bill, would you would you describe your experience uh with carrying that sign into all those stadiums around the country? Sure, sure. Uh first of all, you just get a ticket from a fan. Some fan has come, you know, maybe they got four season tickets and one of the kids is sick and mom stays home with the sick kid and dad brings the other to the game and he got two sick tickets to get rid of. If he doesn't sell them before he goes in, they're worth nothing. So usually you get a ticket, if it's a regular game, you get a ticket for less than face value. And then you go in, uh, I guess I, I wanted to have it here. Uh, my most dramatic thing was in China. Uh, in China, and I and I, I messed it up too. I, I should have stopped and prayed more. But I had this sign that said Jesus Christ in Chinese. And at the women at the women's diving, and China loves their women divers because they're the best in the world. Oops, we lost. Did we lose him again? Yeah, it's frozen. Bill? came oh and i noticed i uh, didn't think too enough about it i noticed i was surrounded by guys who had big telephoto lenses on their cameras and directly opposite me of course was the television camera but i later realized that i was sitting right in the middle of all the international journalists they had been given that prime spot that i needed also and uh, these two guys came over to me and they said did you know that you're the most famous sports fan in the world? I said, <laughs> I said, I didn't even know I was a sports fan. <laughs> and then they, one of them was from Hong Kong and the other one was from Paris, I think. And uh, so when I came back for the men's dive in the afternoon, I went to that same spot and uh, I was thinking, well, do I want to wait until they get down to the final eight guys and everybody's watching? Or, but I thought, well, if I, if I wait and they don't bother me, I'll wish that I had done it all. And without thinking and praying enough, I pulled out my sign and suddenly here's a dozen guys in uniforms coming up the aisle to, to get me. And uh, I ended up spending the afternoon in the security office underneath the swimming pool. And there's this guy raving on the phone and uh, this young girls translating says he says you can't do that here <laughs> i said well tell him i'm done this is the last day of the of the uh, it was the it was the asian games it was the war it was the the test run to see if china could do an olympics it was 1990 asian games and uh so uh Oh, something that happened earlier was the first event that I did, and I hadn't didn't do much. The first event I did, uh, I had the sign, and it was the men's gymnastics. And they were going over the high bar, and I was right behind them with this sign, 
and a bunch of kids said, what does your sign say? What does your sign say? And I turned around and I held it up and they all screamed, Yeshu Chi Tu, which is Jesus Christ in Chinese. And later when it was all over and too late, I realized that if I had waited until the final dives, when everybody in the country was watching and then brought out the sign and they had tried to, to come get me then, and I had turned to the crowd and held up the sign and screamed, Yeshu Jitu. The entire crowd would have screamed, Yeshu Jitu, into every television set in China. And all the international journalists surrounding me would have blown it all over the world. Instead, I was down underneath the pool because I didn't stop and pray and think it through. I acted hastily. So that's... Um, Another time I was behind the, the, uh, the a tee shot on uh, a par three and this kid was, said, ah, we don't want you next to us with that John 316 shirt. We don't want that religious junkie around us. And I said, well, how did you learn? They said, we're and here so our friends can see us on TV. And I said, well, how did you know you could get on TV if you stood here <laughs> by watching you, you know? And then I just felt the spirit say, where are you from? And they said, uh, we're from Cincinnati. I said, no, Jeff, you know, and then I forget the other name. That, that, oh, yeah, yeah, we know both of them. Well, Jeff was the head pro at one of the golf courses there. And the other guy was the director over all the public golf courses. Mm -hmm. The guy who was the director of all the public golf courses mm -hmm. was also the head of full gospel businessman in Cincinnati. I don't mm -hmm. know his name. Look at me now. But suddenly they become friends, you know. And uh, most people are pretty open to it and pretty friendly. But sometimes you run into some hostility. And, uh, uh, but it's... Uh, if you get the if you get the sign on the winning goal of the World Cup soccer, forty percent of the people on Earth see it live, and most of the rest of half of the rest of them will see it either on a video or on the evening news or something like that. So you can reach about seventy percent of the people on Earth with a sign in the right spot. But the only spot that's that good is the winning goal of the World Cup soccer, and we got it in Mexico, but we didn't get it in Italy. And those are the only, well, and we, in, uh, in the United States, uh, repent. Some guys from the Christian brothers out in California had repent on the, the winning shots when uh, Italy won the World Cup here. As the, the Alex Ribeiro, I remember his name, is the guy who told me it was too early to have the, the Revelation 13, 6, 13, 18 and the Korean sign. Uh, he also taught me that when I'm doing something outside the United States, that instead of John 3.16, I should use Jesus saves, because almost everybody in the world knows who Jesus is, but they don't know who John 3.16, what John 3.16 is. They don't all have access to a Bible. Uh, they might not even know that that's a Bible verse. But if you put Jesus saves, they know what that means. Uh, Roland switched away from Jesus saves because drunk sports fans would mock the idea that Jesus saves. But when they saw John 3.16, they would become curious. And I found that in my early years of doing it, if I was walking across a golf course and I heard somebody say, what's John 3.16? Uh, I would not answer them unless they were directing the question to me, if they were just asking their friends. I, and their, people didn't seem to know. But after a couple of years, every time I heard somebody say, what's John 3.16? I heard a personal friend of theirs quote it to them, tell them what John 3.16 was. And I was walking up to the clubhouse in, in Dallas again uh, at the golf tournament there. And uh, I don't even know if I would have been allowed into the clubhouse. I know I was allowed to walk up the stairs. I didn't know what kind of badge I had or anything. And uh, as I was walking up the stairs, there were these four guys standing there. And one was a, a very distinguished looking man with gray hair. And one of the other guys looked at me rather disdainfully and said, what's John 316? And the tall guy with the gray hair said, 
for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, <laughs> quoted the whole thing to him. And that guy would not have heard that from me, but he heard it from that guy. So that guy could have been mm. the club president. Obviously, he was somebody that was much respected by the guy he was talking to. And so those are, are some things. The first year that I did it, uh, I hitchhiked about 30 or 35,000 miles and got signs on 77 network television programs. Slept outdoors more than half the time, had less than $3,500 passed through my hands, but did not lose any weight. <laughs> and that, that was maybe my most anointed year of my life was 1985 doing that. Later on, I had a vehicle to, to drive and sleep in, and that was good too. I was, but for that first year and a half, I hitchhiked everywhere. Wow. Bill, I, I won't, I'll never forget the testimony of the man who came in to speak to Wednesday Warriors. Oh, and yeah. in his testimony, he, he said that your sign, he'd seen on some football game, I think, and uh, right. he received Jesus as a result of that. Yeah, that was a congressman from Athens. Right. Braun or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And actually, uh, as I heard his story, I knew that that wasn't personally my sign. I knew from his description that it was Roland's sign, uh, oh. but it's still the ministry. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, and when I first got involved with full gospel businessmen, I thought this is all that they, to, to figure out my original idea of living without the, the cash uh, came before I was even saved. The idea of rural, now I would know, rural Christian community growing their own food and living sort of a subsistence, uh, but growing everything that they needed. And uh, in farming, there's a lot of work, but there's also spare time when you can be Bible studies and all this, or when you can be led by the Spirit to go plant, you know, a strawberry patch or blueberries or stuff so that everything like the guy who really taught us how to do it was George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was teaching second generation freedmen who learned how to read and come to college, how to go home and acquire five or 10 acres of land and get everything they needed off of that five or 10 acres of land. And then they were, at first they had cotton as their uh, cash crop. And then he saw that cotton was depleting the soil, but the peanuts would get the nitrogen from the air and put it back in the soil so that you could rotate peanuts and cotton. And you know, I, Carver is one of my all-time favorite people. I visited his museum at Tuskegee. And uh, when he told everybody to plant cotton, nobody would ever or plant peanuts. Nobody had ever heard of it. And suddenly everybody's got a barn full of peanuts and uh, you can only stuff so many into the kids. There's no market for it. And it was the only time in his life that he ever had friends angry with him. And he'd get up every morning right before the sun and watch the sun come up and the dude evaporate and the forest wake up. And his day was sitting on a log and he said, God, why did you make the universe anyhow? And the Lord said, you asked too big a question for your little mind. He said, why did you make man? <clears throat> and he said, your question is still too big and your intent is not correct. And he said, why did you pick, why did you make the peanut? The Lord said, now you're talking, pick up all you can carry and take them into your laboratory and take them apart and I'll show you. So first he took them apart like out of the shell, but then he took them apart like water and peanut oil and amino acids and different components that a chemist could get out of a peanut. Then the Lord said, mix them together at different temperatures and different pressures and see what you get. So he'd mix two parts of this. And so he just, that's how he invented all those, made all those things out of peanuts. He made plastic, bricks, <laughs> peanut butter, 300 different things. And then there was a market for peanuts and his friends weren't mad at him anymore. They could just get all the peanuts out of the barn and go sell them. <laughs> Did you do something but, for polio? What? 
me do something for polio? For what? Polio. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. He, he, he recommended massages with peanut oil for, for polio. And apparently it was working, it was working well. And, uh, and that was before there was a way before there was a, he died before there was a polio vaccine. So I guess in his lifetime, the best thing for uh, polio was massages with peanut oil. Uh, wow. Roger Bannister had something that, I don't know if it was polio or what it was, but his family massaged his legs all the time. And he ended up running the first four minute mile. So. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. Oh, and I'm seeing this. Uh, I'm just looking over here. A couple other things that I had set out here. Uh, this unauthorized biography of George Bush. It's really good, really detailed. You know, 650 pages with lots of footnotes of mostly, almost more about Prescott Bush than about George, about where the family's fortune came from and the connections to the Harrimans and the skull and bones and all that. And it was done by people who were followers of a guy named Lyndon LaRouche. Hmm. And most people have never heard of Lyndon LaRouche, but he ran for president five times. And one of them while I was up in New Hampshire, I saw some of his literature. Wow. It was long and complicated and detailed, but it was full of all this information about people. And then uh, Lyndon LaRouche ended up being Jim Baker's cellmate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's <laughs> phenomenal. You know, we see God orchestrating, we see God working. And I, I just um, want to reiterate the confirmation of, I think two or three weeks ago, I mentioned that God had this guy's, how encyclopedic this guy's knowledge was. He said, as I laid on my bunk below Linden's, I would open my Bible dictionary or some other theological book and pick out the most remote word or subject I could find, something I knew little about. Then I would call up and say, Linden, tell me about this. Linden would launch into an explanation of the subject that often matched the material in the book almost word for word. And they said he was like that about all kinds. And, and he'd get these reports from his people at 6 o'clock every morning before everyone else woke up. And he'd know what was going to happen in Iraq. A desert storm was going on at that time. He'd say, this is what's going to happen. And then two or three days later, it would. Uh, interesting. And then Phil Haney's book is out again. It's out paperback now. So it's been reprinted in paperback. The book he was working on when they killed him uh, did not get published. Uh, I'm trying to communicate with the people who got this to come out as a paperback and who uh, would know about the, the, uh, the new book was called uh, national security meltdown and it was about how the guys were the unindicted conspirators in the holy land foundation trial in 2008 uh should have been put on trial and instead they were invited into the government as consultants on how to talk to muslims and now they're full-time in the government they're, they're they are the government <laughs> and that, that's why the whole homeland security is more focused on white nationalists than they are on uh, on Islamic jihad. And Phil said all that was going to happen, that they were first they were going to switch the focus to white nationalists, and then they were going to say that that was all Trump, and then they were going to say anybody who supported Trump was a white nationalist, and then go on from there. And it's pretty much happened. And there's this thing. I always common wisdom or something like that, that the Muslims are putting out that's being bought into by the Pope and a lot of Christians and a lot of all religions. They're working on, they're working real diligently 
on creating the new world religion. It's a combination of new age, Islam, and nominal Christianity. 